amen and amen. We are starting a new series that I'm really excited about for the next four weeks. If you are new to One Church, we do a new series every four weeks. We think it keeps it fresh, keeps you engaged with what's happening. So we are starting a new series called Kingdom Come. Kingdom Come. No matter who you are, if this is your first time to church or you are longing to go deep, you want something that's going to challenge you, no matter where you're coming from, I think all of us can agree on this foundation, that we can feel the tension in our country right now. Like maybe more than ever, right? In our lifetime, we can feel the tension politically, racially. I mean, you name it, all over the place. This movement, that movement. Are you on the left or are you on the right? Are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? Are you pro-life or are you not pro-life? All these questions, and we feel the tension, right? And as your pastor and as your leader, I want you to know as, as Christians, we can't turn a blind eye to these things. Now, we can't just come in here on a Sunday morning and lift our hands and say, God, thank you that I'm blessed, but I don't know what's going on in the world. Our mission and our vision here is we are for the one. We're for the one. So we gather here, yes, to encounter God, but we gather here to be refilled, to be refocused, to be sent back out of these four walls. Are you with me? So here's my question. As a Christian in 2022, how do we engage with what's happening? How do we have a good witness in all of this? Because it's complex. It's deep. It's not just a one size fits all. You can't just slap a Facebook post on what you think is Christianity and that describes your whole view of everything. But we need to be talking to people. Are you with me? Having real conversations with real people who think differently than us, who talk differently than us, that don't believe like us, that don't vote like us. We need to be having conversations. Just making sure you're with me. With people. Not just Facebook posts. I'm a Christian. So what does this mean for us? I think as I was just wrestling with this sermon, man, sometimes I prepare a sermon and I'm like, okay, Holy Spirit, I see where you're going. Okay, this is it. And then sometimes I just stay up and I can't stop thinking about what God wants to say because I'm just wrestling. I want to get to the point where I know exactly what God wants to say to you all. Every time I prepare a sermon, that's just good for you to know. I don't think of, hey, what would sound cool? What would get a nice uh, YouTube like? I want to hear from heaven and share that with you. I just want you to know that. So anything that I share with you this morning, I have bathed in prayer. And I won't get it all right. I'm not perfect. I'm in the same boat as you. I'm trying to figure this out. But four things I think so many people are trying to figure out their own version of right now. Truth, identity, reality, and morality. Is this not what we're all fighting over on Facebook? Truth. Well, your Facebook truth is your truth. You believe what you want. You follow your heart. This is what the world is telling us. But the Bible says, no, no, no. Your heart is deceitful above all things. If you want to follow what you think is truth, it will lead you to a place of destruction. It will lead you to a place where you are more confused than you were before. But Disney says, no, 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 follow your heart. The world says, follow your heart. Your truth is your truth. We're just cool. Guess what? That's leading us to a place of destruction. It is. And I love you too much to not tell you that. Number two, identity. You can go back to the next. Yeah, right here. Identity. Who am I? What's my purpose? What am I doing here? Who created me? What is my value? Do I have any worth? Three, reality. You know, this is really funny. My brother-in-law might be watching online. He just dedicated his little baby girl last week. Can we just clap for the baby dedications? <laughs> Side note, that was awesome. <laughs> but my brother-in-law, he, he works in virtual reality. Anyone ever put on a quest and then you're like, you're like all dizzy and you're like, I'm never using that again? Um, well, he works on those things. And I think, you know, reality at this point is just subject to what people think up here. Isn't that crazy? Like if you think it, if you can dream it, then you can do it. You know, that, that message that we teach all of our young kids, be whatever you want, do whatever you want. You can be whatever you be. Guess what? That is not what Jesus wants for them. What Jesus wants for them is to surrender wholeheartedly to them and to receive his plan for them. Are you with me? Like this is real stuff that's happening in our country, that's happening in our city. You just do whatever you want. Believe whatever you want. Be whatever you want. And guess what? The heart is deceitful. So what are we going to believe? Morality. What's right versus wrong? What's the line? So John 14, 6. I felt three passages of scripture that I just want to read as almost like a mini sermon into the sermon. Is that okay? 
just three passages of Scripture, we need to be anchored to the Word of God, you guys, more than ever. I believe that the Word of God is true, alive, breathing, active, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And more than ever, as a church, we need to stand on the Word of God. Amen. We're not going to stand on our own opinions, our own values, what we like about the Bible. Jackson said this before. This is not shopping cart Christianity. You can't just go down the aisle and take what you like and what you don't like. This is the Word of God, and it all comes. So John 14, 6 I just want to come back to the very basics with you for a moment. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's just start here. Christianity is not just one of the religions. It's the only way to heaven. It is. It says in 1 Peter, you guys, that in the last days, people would be deceived by things that are taught by demons. We're just not talking about this stuff. We think Christianity, even as Christians, sometimes we're like, well, I like the religion of Christianity. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way. What are we believing? What are we giving our heart to? He says, I am the way. Moving on to the next passage of Scripture, and I just want to encourage you with this phrase again. With everything that's happening on Facebook, Instagram, Fox News, whatever you watch, whatever you give mind space to, as Christians... If you believe in the name of Jesus, you are saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, you are not lost. You're not lost. We don't have to be worried. We don't have to be living in fear. We don't have to be going crazy. It says that his peace would transcend all understanding. Guard your heart and your mind. Are you with me this morning? Is anybody with me? I'm just giving you scripture. We need scripture right now. We don't need more feelings. We don't need more emotions. We don't need, I just found out that new teaching. We need to come back to the basic truth of the word of God. What does it say about us? What does it say about what's happening? So the next scripture, Isaiah, this is a prophecy of Jesus. For us, a child is born. This is read oftentimes at Christmas time. A child is born. This is talking about Jesus. A son is given. And the government, everybody say government. Uh Uh-oh, we just said government in church. Are we allowed to do that? Uh Uh-oh. The government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. I just felt this scripture needed to just be read to remind you. He's the Prince of Peace. He can bring a peace and a unity that no movement, that no political party, that no agenda, that no new age teaching could bring. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we become one. Only through the power of being reborn into the kingdom of God, and being filled with the Holy Spirit, will you start to love people that don't think like you, that don't talk like you, that don't dress like you, that don't vote like you? It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's it. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign. Everybody say reign. I'm so thankful that Jesus is coming back again, that he will fully establish his kingdom. He will wipe every tear. He will make every wrong right. He will bring justice He will reign his kingdom, establishing and holding it with justice, righteousness, on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. I told you this is the sermon before the sermon. Is that okay? And the last scripture I just want to remind you, just bringing you back to the very simple truths. John 18, 36. So what is this kingdom? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And so... My question this morning for this sermon that I've just really been wrestling with myself is what's the line? What's the line? Like I said, I'm talking to believers and non-believers this morning. What's the line? And I love this story in Scripture, John 8, 1 through 11. Jesus, uh, he, he meets this woman who is caught in adultery. This woman is in sin, and she's brought out before the Pharisees. And we see this interaction between the religious, everybody say the religious, and then what does Jesus say to this woman? And I want to unpack this with you just over the next few moments. I think this is really interesting. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Verse 2, at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. And teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group. And they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. 
And the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down. He started to write into the ground. Anybody ever read this story, seen this story? What is he doing? And he started to write on the ground with his finger. Verse 7. Then they kept on questioning him. He, he straightened up to them and said, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first one to throw the stone. I love Jesus. Verse 8. Again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. It goes on to say, At this, those who heard this began to go away one at a time. Everybody say one at a time. All of the religious that thought they had it all together, they figured it out. They were sinless. They were faultless. They have achieved perfection. Jesus says, okay, really? Let's put this to the test. If you are the perfect, why don't you throw a stone? One by one, they go away. The older ones first. And only Jesus was left until the woman was standing there. Verse 10, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. The first main point that I want to challenge us with this morning is King Jesus. He reigns with grace and truth. The kingdom that is not of this world, that we can't box into our political party, that we can't box into our new age movement, our new exciting newest greatest movement, his kingdom is not of this world. And you need to know that he reigns with grace and truth. Turn to your neighbor and just say, it's not one or the other. Turn to the person behind you and say, it's not one or the other. So again, what's the line? What's the line of grace and truth? How do these go hand in hand? John 1.14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and the only son who came from the father, full of, everybody say grace. And everybody say truth. truth. I think I've shared this before in a sermon. I know we're just like going deep this morning. Is that okay? Can we just be real? Can we just like actually talk about what's happening? So I think there's this pendulum swing. This is just my opinion, okay? I think there's this pendulum swing generally, generationally between grace and truth. I just personally think in my grandparents' generation, you see a very strong swing of truth. And some of us would call this the fire and brimstone preaching. Are you with me? Anybody with me? It's all truth and it's no grace. You, you need to repent. You are going to be burned. You have all these negative condemning kind of statements. And then I think generationally in my generation, it swung all the way over here. It's all grace and it's no truth. You do whatever you want. Whatever feels good, sounds good, looks good. You just do you and nobody's going to condemn you. Are you with me? Both are wrong. This is not the kingdom of God. We need grace. Everybody say truth. truth. Jesus came full of grace and full of truth. We don't like this because we can't box this in. It's complex. It's beyond a political party. It's beyond a family. It comes down to the individual heart. Are you with me? And Jesus only knows the heart. So what do we do with all this? I don't have all the answers to this, but I just want to take you through a journey of what I think the Word of God sets up for us to love people well. Is that okay? So John 8, 10 through 11, let's come back to the scripture. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. She said, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, now go and leave your life of sin. I want to put this phrase up on the screen. When the Pharisees wanted to accuse her, Jesus accepted her just as she was. This was a moment of accusation, and Jesus got on the ground with her and said, I accept you just as you are. Are you with me? He demonstrates belonging. He says, I'm not afraid to be associated with you in this moment. The religious left, and guess what? I'm associating willingly with you out of love because you are my daughter. Are you with me? She was accepted. Some of you are like, okay, but there's more to the story. Let, just hang with me here. First off, imagine how this woman must have felt. The shame, 
the guilt. I mean, literally, she's brought before a crowd of probably all men. Vulnerable. Just so on display. And the religious, she's getting ready for Jesus to accuse her, right? She's getting ready for something to happen. And the religious leave, and God in the flesh, John 1, 14, we were just reading, the word became flesh. God took on a human body. Jesus is right there, and he doesn't condemn her. How powerful is that? How does that apply to what's happening today in our country? So my question that I was wondering is, why is Jesus riding in the dirt? Anybody else wonder that? So I was looking up commentaries. Again, I try to dig in not only to what the Holy Spirit's saying, but what, what if biblical commentators said about certain texts that have already studied this more than I have. And this is really interesting. Jeremiah 17, 13 from the Old Testament. Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. This is what this one commentator was saying. This is so powerful. Jesus is making a statement to the Pharisees right now. When he gets down and he writes in the sand, obviously we don't really know what he's writing. Was he drawing a picture? I don't know. Anybody have imagination? Like, okay. I don't know what's he do. But what, what they believed is that he was making a statement to the Pharisees to really put the fear of God in them. Because in the Old Testament, what this is remembering is there was a time where the spring of living water would come, and if the people of God would have forsaken the Lord, it said that the Lord would write their name in the dust. Jesus is getting down on this level with this woman saying, Pharisees, you're in the wrong. I accept this woman. I bring her to me right now. Are you with me? And makes a message by just touching the dust to, to remind That's why I think they left one by one, because they felt the fear of God in them, that they were convicted. To say it differently, I would say it like this. The Pharisees' religion, everybody say religion. The Pharisees' religion was offended by the welcoming and forgiving heart of God. It was offended. No, 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 She can't be associated with you. She's got to do this. She's got to do that. And Jesus says, no, 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 there is a new way. You don't understand my mission. I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. I didn't come to save the righteous. I came to save sinners. So come back to the text. Jesus straightened up and asked her again. Let's just remember this moment. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now here's the part on the flip side. Are you with me this morning? Amen. This is so important to everything that's happening. What's the last phrase say, though? So he accepts her. And then what does he say? Now leave your life of sin. Grace and truth. Not all truth and not all grace. Everybody say grace and truth. This is Jesus' kingdom. This is different than how the world thinks because we want all grace or we want all truth. We want to do whatever we want and just say, I'm forgiven, slap that on. Or we want to use truth as a weapon against other people. Beat them over the head with the Bible. So here's how I would put it in my notes. Jesus offended people with lines of truth and open circles of grace. He offended both crowds. Have you noticed that? Jesus didn't just offend people with grace. He offended people with truth. Not that he was coming after them that way, but the statements that he was making to accept this woman caught in adultery, but then also say, go and leave your life of sin. Both could be offensive, right? Right? Another way to say it would be this. Jesus invites us to come as we are, but to never stay where we are. This is the gospel. Come as you are. Guess what? There's nothing you could ever do to earn the love of God. You couldn't dress up enough. You couldn't have the best speech. You couldn't do all these good works. That is called a works-based gospel. It says, by grace, through faith, we are saved. By the blood of Jesus, that's what makes us worthy. Are you with me this morning? Amen. However, we're not just called to be forgiven. We're called to follow Jesus. When you are accepted as you are, if you have truly encountered Jesus, you don't stay where you are. I 
I don't know where you're at this morning. I hope this is encouraging. Maybe you hate me at this point, but I want to skip to this slide. A true encounter with Jesus, a true encounter with Jesus will never allow you to stay the same. You could pass through church. You could pass through church all day. You could watch different YouTube sermons. You could watch your favorite greatest preachers and all that. That's awesome. But when you have a genuine encounter with God, like you know that you tasted, that you saw, you encountered the living God, you will never stay the same. The way you think should change. The way you talk should change. The way that you love other people should change. Are you with me? When you encounter Jesus, nothing should stay the same. And what we want to do with the gospel is say, I just come as I am and I stay as I am. That's not the gospel. The gospel is not just salvation. Everybody say salvation. Salvation. The gospel is not just salvation, it's transformation. Let me teach you very specific theological words and just make them really simple. Everybody say salvation. Salvation. Everybody say sanctification. sanctification. Anybody ever heard of sanctification before? It literally means to become more like Christ. To work out your salvation means you are becoming more like Jesus. You thought one way before about who you were, about your purpose, why you're here, and then you were born again. Are you with me? And then you see differently. You hear differently. You once were an angry, terrible person, and now you're loving people with gentleness. That's what we would call the fruits of the Spirit. So to put it this way, salvation is not just a prayer. Jesus, thank you for forgiving me. Okay, I'm going to keep doing what I want to do. It's a call to be changed forever. That is the fruit of evident salvation in someone's life. They were this person. Come on, Paul the Apostle. Once a Christian terrorist, now a Christian apostle. Like, it wasn't just salvation, it was transformation. His life completely changed. He was born again, filled with the Spirit. Are you with me? But we want all truth or we want all grace. It's neither. It's both. So where do we go from here? When I said neither, I meant it's not just one. It's both. Number two is this, and we'll be done in just a few minutes, I promise. Our witness, and this is where I'm going to talk to the Christians for a second. Even if a non-believer is in the room, I'm going to just talk to the Christians for a second. Our witness right now is on full display. What we say on Facebook, what we do on Instagram, the things, the conspiracy theories that we're constantly reposting on our stories, it's all on display, just so you know. I'm sure you've already thought about that, but maybe you haven't. Peter says this, straight to Scripture, but in your hearts, revere Christ says, Lord, always be prepared to give an answer. Anybody ever read this scripture before? Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Let me just pause right here. When you decide to stand up for Jesus publicly, that doesn't just happen on the spot. It happens in the secret place. If you are put on the spot, but you have not actually thought this out in prayer and taken it to the Lord, you're not going to respond with boldness of the Holy Spirit. You're going to respond with anger that's of the flesh. Are you with me? Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope you have. We have to engage with what's happening in culture right now. We can't turn a blind eye, right? We have to engage in it with grace and truth. But do this, and this is the part that, that Christians, don't, they don't want to like tuck back. Do this with gentleness and respect, not with slander and gossip and demeaning people, Right? Because we want to put a Facebook post out there that says, I am X, Y, Z. This is what I stand for. And I'm proud because I hit post. And and, and I think the Lord is reminding us, how many conversations are you having with gentleness and respect to those people that you're trying to prove wrong? How many? Or does it just feel good to uh, retweet your position? Verse 16, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you and your good behavior may be ashamed of their slander. I think this is really important to the believers. No matter where you're coming from, we believe at one church that we are united around the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? At the end of the day, guess what? You can't fit the kingdom of God into your political party. You can't. You can try all day long. You can try to replace it. It just doesn't work. So no matter where you are on the spectrum, It's July 4th weekend. Guess what? If you stand up for Jesus, if you stand up for Jesus, put this on the screen, please. You will be criticized either way. You will. 
no matter what you try to stand up for, to protect the unborn baby, if you want to stand up and protect the immigrant, if you want to stand up, to, because these are things that we see in Scripture, right? You can't box it into one side or the other. If you want to stand for Jesus, either way, you're going to be criticized. You will. Look at the Scripture. In the law of Moses, commanded us to stone such women. Jesus, what do you say? Verse 6, they were using this question as a trap. In order to have a basis for accusing him. Either way, you're going to be criticized. You just need to know that. If you're going to rock the boat for Jesus, you better be ready. But as I was thinking about this and how the kingdom of God is so complex, it doesn't fit into either side of wherever we're coming from. There's a few things that I've noticed that I just think we need to remember. Grace, I think a lot of times in a wrong way for both of these, grace is often used as a license to sin. And I already said this, truth is used as a weapon to hurt people. To take it a step further, I think this, we judge others for sinning differently than us. Let's just let that sink in for a second. Let me just be really, really, can we go there? So, so all this stuff that Christians want to say about this movement and that movement, this political party and that, guess what? All the things that they're throwing stones at, they're behind closed doors. Some of them looking at things online that they're caught in adultery. Are you with me? But we want to act like we're the Pharisees, that we have it all figured out. We judge others for sinning differently than us. We look at the sexual sin in our country. And we say X, Y, and Z about it when we're gossiping, slandering, putting people down. Are you with me? Another way to put it into a different box is this. We need more conversations and less posting comments. We really do. Another thing I felt like we need to know, and we'll be done in just a few minutes, like I said. You know, I hear this phrase all the time, at least in the past, I think, with a lot of the college students and youth students I had, they would say things like, well, Andy, I have to post something on, on Facebook because I have to keep people accountable. Have you ever heard that? we got to keep the world accountable. Guess what? Accountability is different between believers and unbelievers. Do you know that? Because we post all these things on Facebook, demeaning people, one-liners, oh, I did my Christian duty. Guess what? Accountability between believers and unbelievers is totally different. Paul says this in Corinthians. What business is it of mine to judge those outside of the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. He's quoting that. So, a reminder. I'm not telling you I have all the right answers. But I do know you can't fit the kingdom of God into your side. There's specific issues that we're called to speak up about. Absolutely. And I think there's specific times where it's time to listen to people. Are you with me? Last point is this, and then we'll be done. Number three, we must begin to see people like Jesus does. Oh my gosh, so simple. But we need this desperately. We need to see people through the eyes of the Lord. As I look throughout Scripture... I told you, we're just going there this morning. I just want to keep it real with you. I think Jesus valued people. Jesus valued people over politics. He really did. Jesus saw every single person with a unique story, a unique background, a unique upbringing. He recognized that there were unique wounds, that there were unique things that were said to him. He's God. Obviously, he knows that we can't know like Jesus says, but are you with me? He valued people. And I look at Christians right now, and I'm stepping on toes because I'm sick and tired of Christians ruining their witness, honestly, just to be really real. I'm sick and tired of Christians representing Jesus, and they are absolutely blaspheming, taking people off to God knows where. And I think this question came to my mind. Are you known by who you are against or by what you are for? We all have to ask that question. Because as Christians right now, I see throughout like all of America, we are all just like waving our cross by what we are against. 
And to be really real, I think that that actually comes out of the overflow of the heart that our walk with Jesus is just by the things we're not going to do. Uh Uh-oh. Because we've boiled down Christianity to an avoidance of sin. Well, I follow Jesus because I try not to get drunk. I, I follow Jesus because I try to not have sex before marriage. We have boiled down our Christianity to an avoidance of sin. How sad is that? When really, Jesus, what was he for? Man, Jesus was for the lost to be saved. Jesus recognized that each individual person had a unique story. Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That was his mission. That was his vision. Let me say it like this. Jesus did not come to defend a political party. He came to save the lost. And my fear for us as Christians is we spend so much more time in the comments than we do sharing the gospel with people that do not know Christ. And guess what? We're on full display. We look like fools to the world as believers right now because we have hours and hours of Facebook comments left and right. Oh, I'm I'm this way, I'm that way. And we're just arguing about all these little things. It's time for us to be one to get over ourselves and say, what still unites us to the gospel of Jesus Christ and who doesn't know it and where are we going to go and how are we going to share this so that they're in heaven with us? I don't know about you, but I think late at night, I'm concerned about that. That we would get to heaven and Jesus would say, you wasted so much time arguing with each other, proving your political party, proving your movement. Well, this is why I think that. And all of these people could have heard you share the gospel that there was a God that loved them and he came full of grace and full of truth. I don't know how this hits you this morning, but it's heavy on my heart. And obviously, you can tell I'm a little fired up. I want to skip all the way to the bottom just for the sake of time. You can't see people like Jesus unless you are born again. Would you stand to your feet with me? Again, like I said, my job is your pastor and your leader. Uh, I'm not here to, to preach a political message. I'm here to share with you the kingdom of God that's different than what you've probably thought, that you can't box it in, that it is complex. And we pray kingdom come in our own version of our mind, right? I joked about this the past few weeks or a couple weeks ago, you know, when we prayed that kingdom come, that will be done. I think we have this vision of heaven that it's going to be like the Baptists over here. Hey, all the Democrats that were Christians over here and all the Republicans that were Christians over here that will all just kind of be, you know, no, 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 no. We're brushing shoulders with everybody. That we are one family united under the simple truth that Jesus is Lord. That everyone calls, everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'm just here to give a different perspective. What still unites us as a body of Christ and what keeps us up late at night that's actually going to be fruitful in the kingdom of God. But I want to put this scripture up on the screen. John 3, 3, Jesus replied to Nicodemus. He says, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. See, we could talk about this all day long and we could say, okay, Andy, I'm excited to to love people well and to treat people as an individual. Yes, but we have to be born again first. Because you won't be able to love people like Jesus did. You won't have the fruits of the Spirit like Jesus did. You won't be able to love people who think differently than you, that talk differently than you, that vote differently like you, that grew up differently like you, unless you are born again and you see them through a whole different lens. Are you with me? We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And maybe you're watching this message. Maybe you're in the room and you're like, okay, Andy, I hear this, but but I don't know if I'm born again. Let me just give you the simple truth of the gospel that there is a God that loves you so much that he was willing to pay the price to get on a cross and die for you. It doesn't matter the craziest things that you've done, the deepest, darkest sin. I mean, going all the way back to the story of the woman caught in adultery, imagine the vulnerability that she must have felt. Imagine the shame And there was a God that loved them so much that while other people counted them out, while other people said they're not worthy of love, let's just cast them to the side. God in the flesh got down and said, I love you so much 
that I'm willing to associate with you, to extend out to you my love. It says that the gospel has redeemed us back to right relationship with God. Everybody say grace. grace. Everybody say truth. Grace. See, the truth of the gospel is this, that if you do not know Jesus, there isn't a neutral place that you will go when judgment day comes. This is the truth of the gospel. This is the weighty part of the gospel. See, we want all grace or no truth. The grace part is that God so loved you so much that he has given himself for you. When we say, Jesus, I belong to you, he's already given himself for you. He's already given everything for you. But then the truth part is, if you want to just treat this like a game or maybe just say, okay, I'm kind of forgiven, we need to know that eternity is on the line, you guys. Eternity is on the line. This decision that you make for Jesus, I don't feel like I do a good enough job of helping you understand the weight of this decision. That this is salvation. This is salvation for your soul. So that you would spend eternity not in hell apart from the Lord, but in heaven forever with the Lord. So I just want to give a response right now. We don't even have music playing or anything. If we just bow our heads, close our eyes. Um, if there's anyone in the room or maybe watching online that you've heard the gospel, the good news, that Jesus gave himself for you, that he died for you, that he resurrected for you three days later, and you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, or you wouldn't say, I have a personal saving relationship with God, and you want to make that decision to be saved this morning, would you just raise your hand? For anyone who's watching online or in the room that wants to make that decision, just pray this prayer silently in your heart with me. Father, forgive me, for I have fallen short. Thank you for your blood that atones for my sins. Lord, right now, I repent of all of my sin. I ask for forgiveness. I receive the good news of the gospel that you died for me. I willingly receive you into my heart right now. I receive the free gift of the Holy Spirit. And I want to live for you all the days of my life. It's in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen and amen. I believe you all that although craziness is breaking out around us and we look at it kind of as a doom and gloom, my heart goes, what an opportunity to be alive, to be a believer in Jesus' name. While the world is lost, we are not lost, and we have the answer. It's in Christ alone. Are you with me? So can we just praise the Lord for that? I believe there's so many people, you all, so many people. Maybe someone gave their life to Christ today. I believe this is just the beginning of what God wants to do. But we're going to end this way as we sing a song. We're going to take communion together. And I can't think of a better way than to come to the table and remember that Jesus came full of grace and full of truth. That he welcomes us just as we are, but when we encounter him, we never stay where we are. Are you with me? And so we remember the story that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, before he would give his life for us, he took bread and he broke it. He gave thanks and said, this is representing my body that's given for them. Eat this in remembrance of me. He gave the cup and he said, this blood represents, this drink represents my blood that was poured out for you, for the new covenant, the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. And we practice open table here. And I think the best way for you to start your relationship with God, other than just praying a prayer in your seat, is to get up out of your seat and to take communion as your first step with the Lord to say, I'm giving my life to you today. So maybe that's you. Maybe you're coming to the table as a sign. Maybe you've never been a believer before, but today is the day that you say, I'm gonna come to the table because you know that Jesus receives you, he loves you, and he has a plan for your life. If we wanna uh, go down the, uh, the side aisles and then we'll go back down through the center, let's partake of this together and we'll worship.